Thank you very much. I'm actually really pleased it took a while to get you to shut up. You should laugh at that point. Um, <laughs> I've just been at Agile Testing Days, which has been an interesting conference. And often there's this great program on conferences. But the thing that you often come away with more than the great workshops and the great talks is the one-on-one -on -one conversations on testing. And every, all of you seem to be talking to each other. I kind of assume, because I don't have super hearing, it was about work-related stuff, especially as Game of Thrones series is, season is over. Um, I don't think anything exciting happened last night, what the, was the baseball games or anything? So it probably was work-related and sharing your problems. I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's my first time in America, and I, I went, let's go for two co test conferences. Um, it has been a bit of an adventure coming here. Um, we, our plane landed in, um, in an airport, <laughs> and in, in an airport in New York, and they, they, they came over the intercom and said, uh, we're having a problem with the jet bridge, we're having a problem with the jet bridge. It's brand new. It should work, but it's not working. And then... I, I left the Edison Hotel, which is really close. That's, that's where we're staying. But don't stalk me, please. And I got to Broadway, and I was holding my phone and entering in. And the map just span around and around and around. <laughs> I, is, is it built on some kind of, I don't know, cursed rock or something? Walking up and down, up and down, and, and, and saying, please phone me. And he says, I'm phoning you. It's going to voicemail. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I, Restarted my phone. I toggled the airplane mode. It looks like I'm going to have a very interesting and a very lost time in New York. <laughs> um, but uh, putting that aside, I'm here to talk to you about the changing role of test leadership. I started in the industry in 1997, I believe. Started out as a developer like many of us. Uh, but with my science background, people went, we called it design proving at my first company. Here's a design prove we've built it. Interesting um, name. Nobody's ever used that ever since. But that's what we call testing. You know, and, and you, you put the groundwork in. You, you work your way up. You become a senior tester eventually. And it, then a t test lead. And eventually you get, in 2013, you get the big role the test manager role, just as it seems everyone wants to scrap that role. <laughs> Have we got a few test managers in the room who feel that kind of pain? Yeah, yeah. But all is not bad, and that's a part of what my, my talk today is. As you can see right next to the name test, test manager is the word and coach. And that's probably the... Uh, too long didn't read or too not long didn't listen version of this talk. You know, that how test management is evolving more and more into people coaching. So let's look at my team when I, when I inherited them. I had, had this kind of hierarchy. Anyone, look, does it look familiar to everyone? Yeah, so you have a lot of junior testers. Because every time something needs to be done, it's like, well, we're, you know, under waterfall. Let's just throw another tester at this, you know. Oh, it's it's bigger, bigger thing. We'll do, just just get it. It's easy. A junior tester can can, get, can do it. We won't go down that road and discuss why that's a bit of a fallacy. You have intermediate testers. You have senior testers. And somewhere at the top, you, wrong button. Somewhere at the top, you have you know the big chief, the test manager, you know, and he's or she is in charge of setting the direction of what you're going to test, making the really, really big decisions. And we, I would never call us uh, Agile when, when I took over the team and we had this big delivery, but we'd have a morning. I like to think of it as a Hill Street Blues kind of um, bre morning briefing, yeah? And it was about what problems we found yesterday as a test team, just, just as testers, what tests we were going to focus on what aspects of the system and any outstanding defects that we really had, had issues with. So it was kind of agile-like, but listen to what, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking for updates on there. You know, it's like, what tests are we focusing on? Defect fixing, 
I am managing, not the team, but the tests, test manager, yeah? Now, that was the way things were when you, we had a big waterfall and we needed to, to spend, I think it always seemed, no matter how big the project, we always seem to end up with six weeks to do it in. <laughs> that, that's estimation 101 for you, you know? No matter, what, no matter what you give as an estimation, you can guarantee it will come out probably to six weeks. Um, <laughs> six weeks and it's week three before you get the first software drop. Um, so, yeah, pretty much like I said, standing in front of my whole horde of adoring masses, pointing to things, and I did had I had this whiteboard of, of, of things uh, that we'd, we'd mark up every day of, you know, so we, we knew we were getting closer and closer, closer. And my duties involved things like creating a plan, focusing effort, reporting progress, reporting issues, pretty much like I said. And then, at the end of my first year, along came Agile, yeah? We decided we weren't going to do it like this because it was kind of, it was kind of annoying the hell out of us. We, we had a, a yearly release, and probably about nine months into that year, yearly release, the customer would realize this was their one release for the year, and you'd get, I don't want to call it scope creep when scope explosion seems much closer to what it is. You know, we, you know, this is our release. We've got to get this in, and you just, mm, can we get more testers, please? So how we broke, broke up the work was completely different, but also it led to a different dynamic in the team. So this would be how a team would look, and, and that blue person there would be the only, only tester. So we'd probably have oh, two BAs and uh, two BAs. We need a developer to do stuff, don't we? Much as I don't like them at times, and they can be a bit annoying. Well, you do need them. Um, so two developers are tester, and that's probably a BA. Yeah, probably was actually seven, but it, it looks better like that. Um, and alongside them, there would be another team. Similar kind of dynamic. Oh, this one, this one. Supposedly, we, we managed to talk the customer into, um, into having two testers. So we must have had a lot of legacy functionality on that one. And then another team with just one tester. And here's me <laughs> to the side <laughs> going, well, mm. <laughs> And... To be honest, under Agile, people didn't really know what to do with, now not just test managers, anyone who was senior. Uh, the first solution was, oh, let's book uh, a project ma manager, a lead developer, and let's book them at 0.3, what am I talking about, 0.33, 33, to each of one of these teams, yeah? And then the customers what didn't really like that because we're carrying people as an overhead, and you know, so that's not great. So eventually, it led to, to all of our, our disciplines to have to redefine what our, what our role was to these individuals in this team. <laughs> so yeah, so we all, got, we all got that about six months in, and it's like, yeah, the customer doesn't want to pay, pay for you anymore, yeah. So you're kind of like, this is my experience. waiting for the call. Hey, we need a test manager. The call never really came. And like I said, this whole 0.33 on so many, so many things didn't really work. So we tried some new things. We, we read heavily, and as, as you might, I mean, might have guessed, one thing that we, we, we talked a little bit about was the Spotify model, yeah? And what we eventually did was, is, is very like that, but it, we kind of went through it the hard way, yeah? We didn't just say we're going to um, copy Spotify, but uh, we realized that our focus for me as a test manager stopped being really the tests, and it started to be the team. 
So my relationship to those individuals became more important than what those individuals were doing. And that was hard. That, that, that actually was really, really, really hard, yeah? Because you're, you're used to having this idea of you're responsible for the tests that are delivered by your individuals. And it feels uncomfortable to say, so, so I, you know, so I, I step back now, I, I don't need to check the work or anything. Yeah, it was, it was, it was hard. As that changes, it becomes a lot more about looking at the people who are doing this work on your behalf and building a level of trust. And I think that's hard. I think that's incredibly hard. I think I, I stand, stand here looking back, and I like to think I, I, I absolutely trust my team, but I've worked with them for six years now. Yeah, And five years ago, that some of them had quirks, and some of them had unknown things about them. Um, and as much as I wanted to trust them, I also wanted to check the work just to make sure. So letting go of that control was a big part of the journey. So in this new way, way of doing things, my focus became more working with individuals and helping each individual to grow. Things like talking to them about the problems they experienced so they would bring problems to me instead of me looking for the problems. I'm a tester. I like to look for problems myself, yeah? But also talking to them about what training they want to do, but also doing the people management, more of the people management. Uh, we have an annual review process that uses a 360 review. Are you familiar with those kind of things? So I'll ask have a series of questions, which um, I'll go and ask the people that, that work with them and get feedback on how, how they work, yeah? Uh, and that's always, always useful. 90% um, of the time, it's really illuminating in a positive way. And I try and make the experiences really positive. What's actually really interesting is we've, we've come to trust each other in an interdisciplinary way. The stuff that isn't praise isn't bad now. Often it's like, um, this has been recorded for posterity, so I, I need to change the names. <laughs> so Bob is awesome. Bob is, Bob is an awesome uh, tester. They really know their, um, they really know their, their technical testing really well. They understand what we do for automated testing. We want to see them to start writing some of these automated testers. And believe me, some of the developers that started to say that, who were very protective about the automation code, that was a major thing for Dennis, yeah? So I'm saying to him, we want you to work on this next year. But it's really positive that you're even in this ballpark where people are saying, we want you to do this. Uh, another member of my team, um, Ishani, I can't think of how to make her name. Um, Likewise, it's like we want, we want to see Ashani leading more. She's fantastic when she leads, yeah? Um, things like that, are the kind of, they're the kind of um, feedback that we all want, really, doesn't, doesn't it? And that kind of level of encouragement is really, really, really important. And I really enjoy doing the 360s with my team. I, I don't feel that they tend to be onerous. But it also, a key thing is that you don't just do a 360 at the end of the year, that you, you do it throughout the year, that you, you constantly sit down with them. Um, we've tried to make our catch-ups more and more informal. So we, we do it actually in a coffee shop. Um, Wellington likes to think it's very good on coffee. So at the basement of our, the lobby level of our building, there, is, there are actually two cafes to choose from. Um, and once a month, we just meet up over a coffee, a hot chocolate, or I think somebody has a ginger tea occasionally. Um, but it, it's, it's to make it relaxed, because it's not, it's not a formal kind of, I, I can't be, can I really be formal with a Tinkerbell book? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But you know, kind of, oh, you said what, oh, and oh, yeah. But try, trying to leave the paperwork behind and just say, say how's things going, yeah? 
what's the, what challenge? It's just what challenges are, are you uh, encountering? Uh, is it going well? Are you happy where you are? Yeah. Uh, particularly because sometimes we have people now off site with different customers and sometimes with different teams within my own company. It's really important to, to have that that time to catch up with somebody who isn't your isn't your your actual line manager, but is in, responsible for looking after you on an individual level. And there have also been examples where people have gone through a difficult life things. We'll call them that, yeah. And it's really useful to have somebody that can touch base with them and can can talk to other levels of management of this is really important. I want to, we need to support this person. We've invested a lot of money in them and they're ha you know, money and time and they're our friends, yeah. And they're going through a bit of a rough patch. That rough patch has a has a finite length. But we want to make we want to make sure that they're supported so that we don't lose them because they're fantastic. We really we have, you know, we've invested at least six years to grow people to this level. And I think a, a key part of the importance of that, of how it's worked, is I've seen in that time, uh, three members of my team go from being intermediate slash juniors to senior testers. Yeah? And we've seen that level of growth. By the way, it's, it's also important to, to mention, occasionally something happens and it's really, really difficult and we sometimes the coffee shop's not always the great great solution. I'll some, we'll sometimes have coffee, realize there's a bigger problem, and it's like actually we're going to book the formal meeting room so that we can do this in, in quiet, yeah, not with with people going all all around, and it, it can be more confidential. But we'll, but start by being informal. Another key key part of this is um, our monthly get together. So as a team, we, we have a, a get-together. It's interesting to see how these, these sometimes go. Sometimes you get the whole team together. All they want to talk, to, talk, about, I, I, talk about is how, what each other's doing, and they will cross-examine each other yeah, about it. Exactly what I hope you were all doing at lunch. You all seem to be. Yeah. Here's, here's what's going on on this project. Because remember, each, each member of the team is on a different project all working on si in similar technologies and with similar-ish challenges. And when one person starts opening up, people go, oh, we, we had this and this is how we did things. And we've had these conversations. And the team as a whole becomes this great brains trust. I'm, I'm hoping you're getting from this technical conference that's similar, not just the people that are standing here. It's your peers. Plugging into your peers is an incredible way to kind of improve your skills to the team, see how the team, team ticks. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but sometimes I'll have this little exercise prepared and I'll come down and we'll, we'll start, start, start off the little round table of how, how people have been going. And the, the dynamic is so good that I don't interrupt. So I've got an exercise and it's like, you know, the exercise can wait, yeah? The team is solving each other's problems, yeah? I just need to facilitate this and make sure you know, make sure that it doesn't get too rowdy. Or um, don't you do you remember that there's a secrecy agreement in place with your team that you shouldn't really be talking too much about this? Um, so that, that's been really important. But also, um, in the last two years, we've we've got agreement from uh, higher management as well to put aside one hour a week uh, where our test team just explores automation. Because there's been more and more of a driver for um, to see us get more involved in automation, um, and for there to be less of a disparity between manual testers and and the, the developers that look after automation. So we want to get some more hands on, yeah. And I won't pretend sit up here and pretend that we we manage everything about our automation, but it helps us to work in better collaboration. With, the, with what the developers have built. And there's certain areas now within the framework that we actually own, we, 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 we actually own, and we know, understand better what's going on and we understand better how to even read the dashboard of the morning's test run as well, which helps, helps us a lot. But it, to start with, it was a varying skill. Uh, and now we've managed to kind of like level up all over the place. We also, um, <laughs> 
We also give everything 95%. Yeah, I, I, know, I, I know there's this cliche that Americans like to give everything 110%. Where'd you get the extra 10% from? <laughs> that usually actually means like you're working 44 hours instead of 40, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, this, this idea that there's, there is 5% of our working, working month, which equates to just one day, that we do not deliver on. Anyone has any idea what we do with that day? Relax. Who said relax? Seriously. <laughs> Not quite relax. <laughs> learn. Yeah. Self-development. Learn. And a lot, of our, a lot of our waterfall testers hated, absolutely hated uh, going into Agile originally because it says, yeah, we, we always had the six weeks of absolute hell. By the way, I've just realized I've got on. We had this six weeks of absolute hell, but afterwards we'd be supporting the customer in their initial trials, yeah, and it got really quiet so I could pick up a book and kind of thumb through stuff and I could learn stuff and it was really relaxed. With Agile, it's like sprint after sprint of terror. <laughs> it's like, oh, 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 we delivered on this sprint. Oh, there's another sprint. Quick, quick, quick. Let's try and deliver everything from there. So, bam, 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 like this regular thing. So, having a day a month, say, do you know what? I'm going to work on something I really want to. I want to expand what I can do. It was really important. And it has been really, really important because in the last six mm, years, years, um, we've had to do things we'd never done before. When we learnt, launched our project, product in 2013, um, the customer was adamant, you know, this will work on a laptop, no one will use it on, on a, no one's going to use it on a phone, no one's going to use it on a tablet. Those things are just cliches, yeah. Brr. Somewhere along the line, 2015, yeah. actually, so that wasn't that long actually. It was like, no, no, actually, people are using it on a mobile. Actually, mobile first. We should, this should be designed to work on a mobile first and foremost, yeah. And Although we knew how to do cross-browser testing, working on, on testing mobile devices was, was new. We've had, we, we work in a, uh, with a system that's increasingly uh, more highly available. How do you test that? We've had to work that out. Uh, our systems now tend to be uh, delivered by Ansible, so they can be started up and, and stopped. How do you test that? Uh, how do you test accessibility, which has become more and more of a thing? We, we've, we've, you know, we've had to play around with things. And I, and I say the word play around, but that's exactly what you do on the 5%. You play, you try and work things out, you try and get a handle on things. And it sounds like a waste, but that's, that 5% is invested in the future. Otherwise, what happens is, you know, eventually you have to fire all your team and hire somebody else with new skills because you're, you've got people who can only work in Windows 95 or something because you've never given them the opportunity to level up and, and get with, with the program. I mentioned as, as well that, like I said, um, with the rise of automation, um, we've negotiated this hour a week, which has been really useful. In everything that I, I do, and everything that I try and encourage the team to do, this, this idea of playing around, um, not just to read, but to build, to try things, I, th I think that no, no other course for me has really been as influential as, oh great, so they were supposed to plonk on, yeah? I've not, it was rapid software testing, yeah? And they, that's James back at the bottom. Has everyone here done rapid software testing? Can you put your hands up? Yeah? Yeah, so James or Michael are very rarely in New Zealand, and, I, and this course so heavily aligns with how we, we've ended up working. I always try and make sure at least a couple of our team are gone, yeah? Because it's, it's been really, really useful. Um, If you've done the course or if you've ever 
ever, ever done an exercise with James back, yeah, he, he's poshy. He can be, can be very poshy. But he also believes a lot in creating a safe environment in his workshops, yeah? So he wants, wants people to, to feel a bit tense and awkward in the way that, unfortunately, it can be very tense and awkward for us as test leaders to see what, how people do. And I found it very useful to, to look through some of the exercises that we did with him and to create my own, to create my own exercises that, that replicate some element of what we do in software testing. Um, an example, well, I'll, I'll show you some later on. I've put some, a few on my website. I have a, a number guessing game, which is based on 1980s. Um, if you ever built a computer program the first time in the 80s, the first thing you would do was a na na uh, random number generator, yeah? You know, and you guess the number, you know? It tells you too high, too low, or just right, yeah? Now, being a very experienced tester, I've created uh, I think it's about 13 builds of that where there's just a little defect in it. And when I do training with, because I also, one of my roles as, as well at Datacom is to do training with people who are maybe in our service desk and either want to get better observation or want to get, consider a career in software testing. And there's a whole load of exercises I, I, I work with this game where, where it says, okay, hey, play the, play the game, tell me what's wrong. And it's actually, a, I found it with some people, it's a lot harder than you'd think. But, so, this, so just pretend that you could have seen his face, but then you can see, going through, I go through my RST notes every two years and just kind of go through the, the actual handwritten notes. And there's certain feedback that he gave to me, which I found really useful, and I return to it every so often because I still, although I'm improving in these areas, it's still a challenge for me to be perfect. So an example of this was um, yeah, good testers work on their strength, balance team with skills you don't have. When I work, work with other testers, I always look for testers that complement each other. When we look to place two testers together on a team, we look for two testers who have got different types of skills to each other. Um, People can't be smart if they feel stupid. That's really important when you're building an exercise. If you're building an exercise and it makes people feel stupid, they will never learn anything. And sometimes I've got to make sure I don't try and be too clever for my own good. Uh, I always hate these exercises. Particularly, have you ever done the, the one where you're, you're in an aircraft, you're broken down, and there's a list of 20 things, and you have to order them according to which ones you'd take and which one you'd leave behind. Yeah, well, the, the, there is an exercise like that. And at the end of it, you, you work as a team, you create a list. And then someone says, well, you've, you've done it all wrong because this is the actual list. And I was like, feel, well, why did you make us do the exercise? Yeah. Uh, a good exercise allows you to, to apply the skills that you've got and that me as a coach will sit with you and, and go, that's really good because that's your style. Yeah. Don't try and make other people do my style, but try and do, try and work out how they solve problems and then go, okay, here's some things that you could do to kind of uh, expand the way that you do problem solving or the way you, that you approach. So for instance, over yesterday, I, I ran a, a test strategy workshop at Agile Testing Days and I provided, I provide quite a lengthy document for people to, to look at. And Almost always, the testing solutions are good, but we all fall into the blind spot of we test it functionally, and then we kind of forget about things like the, the document is riddled with, you know, that there's going to be uh, a high availability here, and security is really important, but they never actually mention what the security is, yeah. So we, we, we as testers tend to be drawn to functional testing, first and foremost, but we have to remember sometimes that an appraisal of, of a system is more than just what it does, but is it up enough? You know, is it usable? <sighs> whoever, whoever, whoever did the thing on my phone today where, where it, the, the, the map just spun around, yeah? It worked eventually when I got a network signal, yeah? But while it was spinning around, it might have 
found the location, but it wasn't really helping me, yeah? A big thing uh, that James had said to me uh, was that I was quite weak on, I was very good at giving solutions, but I often would take assumptions that people would, uh, take assumptions? Uh, I wasn't very good at declaring my assumptions, sorry, and if there was a constraint, yeah, I would just go, okay, yeah, I'll accept that. And, and it's something I still struggle with. I, you know, if you give me a constraint, I go, okay, so that's something I can't manage. I'm good with that, so let's look at the things I can manage, yeah? Try, I try and be quite pragmatic. But every so often, you do need to kick a constraint to see if it's really constraint or someone's just being really difficult. Uh, and that was really good feedback. So every time, you know, I, I've cut and pasted that thing, and I, I've written it in several places. And every time I work on a new project, I, I, I look at that and say, am I accepting too many constraints? Now, each of us is different. Each of us has that own Achilles heel, the thing that we, we don't quite do well. That's why you need a coach. That's why having a coach is really important to work with you and help to develop your skills and also point out, you know, this is, this is an area you, you just need to watch. This is something you do really fantastic, so don't worry about that. Unfortunately, if you don't get feedback, you worry about everything. You either worry about everything or you think you're just superb, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much like I said, a, a good workshop um, has complex uh, real-world problems at its heart. Allows attendees to apply their own ideas. That's not, they're just not copy and pasting you because we don't want people copy and pasting just what we do. And you give feedback on items to help them to grow. Oh. So, oh, so, yeah. Ah, Mike didn't test his own slide deck. <laughs> that one slept through me. I, I obviously copied and pasted it and meant to remove it from the other slide. I am so sorry and a little bit embarrassed. Um. Pretty much like, like, like I said, you know, the thing I really learned from James is, is to, to be challenging and, and to push. And I will often say, I'm not here. Um, I, if you know James back, he always wears a hat as well. And sometimes I will, do, I will put something on, or a badge or a, or a hat on, and it's like, you know, when I've got my hat on, I'm playing your project manager. And if you want, tell me to take the, take the, take the, um, take the hat off. Yeah, it's because it's role play. Um, and I think it's really important to challenge because we, we are put in quite difficult situations at times. But this importance of the safety net, yeah. I, I know not everyone's experience with James has been the same, but when I, I've worked with him, he's always said, you know, you have the option to say, you know, stop, this is just, I need help, you know. You know do you know the how to be a millionaire, you know, the lifeline thing. That's the only game show I know, by the way. <laughs> um, pretty much like I said, working on fake, fake projects like the game, uh, there's uh, an automation project we've been working on. We control the code that we do the automation on. Do you know why that's brilliant? So, so we've got a fake, completely fake project. We build a test framework. We've built the software next to it. And what I've done is I built five versions of the software, and only one of them work. So it allows us to test whatever software uh, automation we build, and also get used to reading logs. Yeah. So oh, what's wrong with this build? Let's just look, read through the logs. What tests failed? What did it actually actually say? You can't do that with production code because it's always important when when it's when it's gone. Just something that's there for pure learning, so that I get used to reading logs, seeing things fail, thinking about how test, even the naming of testing can help me. Uh, we have a project, <laughs> I have a project, this one's always fun and I roll it out at Christmas about saving two astronauts. How do you look at something that looks very waterfall and advocate for testing within it? it it's, we did it for fun in 2014, um, but we revi revisited it more now because we look at it and we're going, although it doesn't say DevOps, it's essentially, how do you fit testing into DevOps, yeah? How do you make things go faster? How do you advocate for a level of quality? 
and Project Blender, which is what I was running yesterday, which is all about a, a dating app. Some tools that I've, I've built over the time that to kind of help people think, think out how they do things. Uh, bleak testing is really, um, if you actually look on my website, because I've now got a, a GitHub site, it's a series of cards that if you go through all the cards and look at a strategy, if you find a card that makes you go, ooh, that means you've probably missed something. Because it's very difficult to find holes in your strategy. So about three years ago, I, 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 I was looking at an app of one of our competitors, and I read all the one-star reviews, yeah? And I got really addicted to reading one-star reviews, yeah? <laughs> Anyone ever read one-star reviews of apps? So that's, you know, you do not want a one-star review on your app. Um, and, and I built up about the first 20, and then I just kept coming out with ones that, I, that I'd like. Um, the, the test plan dashboard was another resource that was really good. Um, and that's just, again, trying to put on a page, here are all the things that we're going to try and do with this test. Because I really struggle, you know, struggle to get my project managers to read anything I write. Um, it's like, oh, you wrote this, that fantastic 30-page test strategy, but I don't have time to read that. And in Agile teams, that's even more. That's one of the reasons why we, we use more and more mind, mind maps. Uh, it's Aaron Hodder. I don't know if you know of him. He's been a huge advocate of them in New Zealand, yeah? And very, it's his, his ideas about them have become very infectious. And they, these are just visual tools, but supposedly at a, you know, each sprint, you know, you test as you come up with ideas of what you want to test for particular stories. And if you try and sit down a developer, it's like you have, you have literally nailed there their hands into the desk and they go, ah, you know, they're talking to me about testing. I don't really want to go through this. But it, a mind map of, here are the things that we're planning to test. And it's, it's really good because you can do it just after stand-up. It can take sometimes no more than about two minutes. And, they offer, and it gets that thing. The thing you're trying to do with any document isn't to say, I'm wonderful about writing documents. It's for somebody to say, but what about? That thing that, you know, and the big thing from our developers tends to be, but what about X? Because we're also changing this. And it's like, I had no idea. And now I do. That means the risks have just gone down, which is really important. So a lot of what we do in our exercises is really just scouting ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, we, 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 start, we, were, we, were, we were messing around with facial recognition before it became a thing. I'm doing, I'm doing this because um, one of my team, Ishani, I'm going to name her, uh, she, she brought back gold, yeah? Uh, so her son has on her phone a facial, you know, he looks at it, unlocks his phone, yeah? He's found, uh, Ishani has found out that her daughter's face also unlocks the phone. <laughs> and there's been a bit of trouble in the Ishani household about that. So um, was that tested? You know, it's like you, you, you put your trust in this really advanced thing. But that, stuff like that is really, is really cool because, of course, um, I, I've actually looked at an old picture of myself and went, is that my son? And then realized, I don't know, that was me many, many years and many, many pounds ago. <laughs> um, we were talking yesterday at Agile Testing Days. How do you take the spirit of a conference back. Um, I had many, many talks about this, because again, I, yeah, five minutes? Yeah, oh, I'm almost yeah, there. Bit. Yeah, big second here. Uh, and one of the biggest things, is essentially, the thing that runs through everything that I've been telling you is we, we just make space. You, you make a space to not tackle things on a big level, but small level, to play around together, to, to explore things together, to explore things one, Past the time. I know I've mentioned James back, but to me also, working with Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory has been really important. I, I find their books have been really helpful to me on this subject. And a really key thing when we, we wrote this book in 2014, when I was going through some changes of my role as well, there was this whole discuss, discussion about is the term 
agile test managers and oxy oxymoron. And it led to a, to a discussion of, you know, your role is not to tell people what to do, your role is to coach people to make thought out decisions. And that's essentially what my role now as a leader within my company is more and more about. And the more I think about this, the more I'm actually okay with this. Because I, I, was, I was terrible at predicting things on graphs and, and ticking things off and, and making colorful things. And no, I, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy with this. This is, this is where I want to be. And this is where I think we are heading. Not as managers of test, uh, tests, but as managers of people. So to me, the, the future of leadership in testing is teaching, not telling. That learning starts with us. That we create safe places to explore. Those are the three really powerful things that it's, it's our duty to take. And I actually, I actually at conference uh, over the weekend, was, 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 was writing down the Tinkerbell Coaching Manifesto. Because I, I re I'd got this, someone had got this book for me. And the more I was thinking about it, the more I felt that as a, as a coach, it's not Peter Pan and it's not the hero and it's certainly not Captain Hulk that we kind of represent, but maybe Tinkerbell. For five reasons. First of all, when we're dealing with people, it's important to be quiet and to let them talk first. To give them space to speak. Secondly, to encourage the whole team to fly. We provide the magic powder to make that happen. But obviously no drugs. <laughs> uh, three, when, we, when we're quiet, we need to drink poison for them. Think about does a lot of dumb things, yeah. She's not perfect, but she always tries to make things right, yeah. And it's important that we, we side with our testers and we champion them. Number four, even when they don't believe in you, it's important that you believe in them. And five, no deals with stinky pirates. Thank you.